no one knew that I was thinking about committing suicide because I didn't tell anyone, you know, because I'm male. You know, I don't talk, I don't tell, I internalise. You know, you're the breadwinner. You're the one that's got to solve everybody else's problems, not the one that needs help. It really was my secret. No one knew. Both my parents were completely oblivious to it at the time. So imagine I've got a gun to your head. Your body goes into shock, yeah? You're going to start shaking. The room is going to feel like it's spinning and your heart is going to start pounding, okay? Now imagine what's that. Imagine what that's like for us every single day. Hmm? Every single day. Every single fucking day. Oh, I'll get by with a little help from my friends. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? I've been with my partner Joe for 12 years now. Wow, 12 years. <laughs> yeah, been with my partner for 12 years. I'm originally from the northern suburbs of Adelaide and I'm the eldest of three. I've got a younger sister and a younger brother and I have an amazing family. I do, I'm blessed. And I'm, I'm also an anxiety sufferer. I'm a singer-songwriter. Um, I'm in year 11. I do English, math, psychology, uh, music performance, Year 12 studio arts photography. I do a lot of performing, singing. I used to be with the, I was with the Australian Girls Choir um, from when I was about seven till I was 12. Um, the reason I mainly quit the choir in year seven was because like when we had to sing in our voice parts and stuff and sing in front of other people, um, I just had a massive panic attack. And yeah, that was the start of the anxiety. I'm not working at the moment, but a normal day for me when I'm working is that anxiety is pretty much setting in whilst I'm getting ready for work. I'm thinking about all of the bad things that could possibly happen throughout the day. And I, I might be going through the motions, but you know, it's a much different story up here in, in my head. Can you start by telling me a little bit about yourself? <laughs> Joey, can you turn that down a little bit? <laughs> Thank you. four, first and foremost, we have a blended family. I grew up in Melbourne and completed a BA in applied art, married went through a separation and then started a new life down here. And the new life was very much about the beginning of my recovery journey. I'm semi-retired. I work for myself. I sit on a number of boards and risk committees. So I work about 50% now. I worked for one of Australia's largest listed companies where I had a number of roles and responsibilities. And when I left the company, that's when I had the mental episode. I have two daughters who live with me. They are 22 and 14, and I recently married again. Uh, I work in aged care training, and it's very busy, but I love being at work because I'm in control there. Um, it just keeps my mind occupied, so it's good because then I don't worry about what's going on at home. I have anxiety and um, it's been a very, a very big journey. Um, three years ago, I was diagnosed with it, um, but I didn't grow up with it or anything. But I don't know why it started. Uh, I used to work somewhere else doing the same role that I do now. And it was just really, really stressful. So I ended up going on stress leave. And that was when I applied for the job that I have now. And then when I started working at this place, um, that's when I started getting all these gastro symptoms every week. I'm 57 years old. But sometimes I claim to be 849 and a time lord. <laughs> that. I live on my own and I've been living here in the same place for 16 years. 
Um, decades ago, they knew that the label schizoid effective fitted me best, but uh, somehow that got lost in translation. <laughs> My first experience with psychiatry was when I was about 16 years old, some really odd behavior. Um, I was really tense and disturbed, um, really pissed off, very angry with my, with my mum and dad. I live a very simple life. I'm very happy doing very ordinary things. For instance, when my husband was alive, we'd sit on the couch. I'd cook dinner, we'd talk about our day and I'd go to bed early. I don't go out late at night or anything like that. I haven't done that for years. It's just Valentine and I now, she's 10 months old. David, my husband, he would have been 61 this week. For his 60th, he got a pension card and a baby. He wasn't ill at that stage. He was diagnosed when Valentine was seven months and he died quite suddenly within about a month. But before then, my first husband, Barry, he died. So I was a widow at 30. My mental illness is bipolar disorder. I'm now a master mental health instructor and I'm so passionate about the topic. Outside of work, I love getting my hands dirty. <laughs> The psychologist said to me once, one of my favourite lines, she said, what makes your cells sing? And I thought, as soon as I get my hands into clay or cement or something really three-dimensional and gooey, I'm an artist. As a child, art was always my way of expressing my emotions. And when I stopped doing it during HSC, that was the first presentation of a mental illness for me. It was an eating disorder. Bang. But I think all along I had a mental illness. It was post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, it hadn't been really acknowledged then. I'd always planned to leave the company at, at about 60 to do this kind of non-executive work. And then four years ago, my role was changed rapidly out of the blue. And the company was like, well, don't worry, you know, we'll look after you and, and, you know, make you redundant and look after you through all that process. And then, um, and, and it was fine, you know, it was like, I was okay. I just accepted it was going to happen. It wasn't like I was kicked out the door or anything like that. But the first thing I noticed was I was having trouble sleeping and I couldn't really see why. So I went to my doctor about that and, and told him what was happening at work. And he said, well, let's just give you something to help you sleep. And that seemed sort of fine. And then I started thinking about committing suicide. It was the result of childhood trauma around the age of six, seven months when the abuse started to happen and it went on for a couple of years. And it really was my secret. No one knew. Both of my parents were completely oblivious to it. <laughs> Sexual abuse. That's what happened to me. When I was in year eight, I started just not eating um, because I was like, if I look like everyone else and I'm skinny, then I will feel better about myself. So I just um, stopped eating and I started exercising a lot. Yet, no matter how skinny I got, I never felt good about myself. So I kept going and I ended up in hospital for it. And yeah, I was 13. When you're a child, you don't know what safe is. You don't know what boundaries are. This is how I see it in my mind. As a child, I probably always had a backpack on my back and inside the backpack was post-traumatic stress disorder, but I didn't know what was in the backpack until I was in my 30s. Tell me a little bit more about what happened to you. Well, I'm on an extended leave of, of absence from work at the moment from my job. A pretty, I had a pretty bad experience a couple of months ago where it triggered, it triggered something off within me. 
I needed to get away from work, so um, I needed to get, get away from here for, for a little bit. I had this pretty strong feeling about you know, heading back to Adelaide. And um, that's funny. You know, I, I identify as Aboriginal, as Indigenous. <laughs> and my partner, Joe, he actually suggested that it was sort of like a, a return to country moment. <laughs> you know, I, I probably did. Yeah, I really did need it, I suppose, and felt really safe because I was, you know, I was at the point of having another nervous breakdown. One day I was at work and I went into a hotel and I went up to the top floor to see if there was a room that was open that had a balcony that I could jump off. This all happened within the space of a, a couple of weeks and if I was ever by myself, I'd just burst into tears. Well, I had a lot of hospitalizations when I was a teen, um, mostly in uh, Warrnambool. Uh, that's where I grew up on my father's farm. Uh, I grew up as a man on the streets of Port Melbourne. Then when I was about uh, 20, uh, I joined a therapeutic community in South Melbourne. Um, that was uh, <laughs> a residential. Um, very intense, um, but they, they offered me hope. They curbed a lot of my, um, my self-harming uh, instincts, um, very, very destructive behaviour. I was 26. I was with Barry at the time and we were living together and he became out of work and it was really sudden. So we had no savings and I was the only one working, paying all of the bills, doing all the shopping, the housework, pretty much everything. And it was just, it was just a really stressful time for me. And I started to hear voices. It wasn't until I did the mental health awareness induction at this new organisation and um, the colleague who was taking it just started telling us her story and then I was sitting there thinking I wonder if that's what I've got because I hadn't sought any medical advice before that so I went to the doctor and he put me on a mental health plan and then I started getting some counselling with that and yeah I got myself some strategies and then I've done a lot of reading since then as well. The treatment that I had at the time they called it a horrible name. Trauma counselling. They've since changed it to exposure therapy. <laughs> I had to go back and revisit it. The memory that I kept as an adult running from, I had to sit in it, eat it, taste it, smell it. And I did it. Second time, it was a bit easier. Third session, it was an absolute day of dawning when I was no longer a victim. I became a survivor. I had some not very nice so-called friends at the time. They were, they were very manipulative. They were making out that I was crazy. They were playing me and Joe off on each other, trying to make us fight. And so I ended up having a, well, the only way to describe it is, a, is having a breakdown. My mum came over to me to Adelaide and, um, and she helped me a lot. I, I love mum for that. No, I wasn't able to function. Uh, she took me off to a GP where I was told I had anxiety and depression. And I was put on antidepressants, very strong medication, which is basically made me gain all this weight here. <laughs> Lots of rolls here. <laughs> More rolls than a bakery store. <laughs> At my doctor's, I was sort of in a zombie state. You know, I know that at one stage I was on the floor screaming and head beating and just sort of completely lost it. You know, my wife was watching all of this. He took me to Royal Melbourne 
where I was committed as an involuntary patient. And they assessed me and diagnosed me with acute depression and extreme psychosis. I had friends, but I'd sort of drawn away from them and they didn't really know what was going on with me. Um, they went and spoke to the school year level coordinator and, and to my mum as well. And they said they're really worried and they didn't know what to do. See, I thought that nobody liked me, but it was just that I didn't like myself. I'd gotten so skinny and so unwell and so undernourished that um, my heart hardly had enough energy to keep beating. They said that if I'd have left it any longer, I would have died. I didn't think I was sick. Looking back, everyone noticed the eating disorder because it was more obvious. Everyone noticed the postnatal depression because it was more obvious. But rumbling with that would have been generalised anxiety. So my life as I live it today seems like a life of wellness. And the centre is my faith. Without my faith, I probably would have committed suicide years ago. And through my faith, I have hope. Let me ask you this. Is there a song that has special meaning or inspires you? Music has been an integral part of my life. I play guitar, self-taught. At moments of pain, I wrote ballads. <laughs> but music very much amplifies my happiness. My favourite song is by Casting Crowns. They're an American Christian band. And their song is about not feeling like you have to hold on to anyone. It's called Be Held. When you're tired of fighting, chained by your control, there's freedom in surrender, lay it down and let it go. So when you're on your knees and answer seems so far away, you're not alone. Stop holding on and just be held. The world's not falling apart, it's falling into place. I'm on the throne. Stop holding on and just be held. Just be I was in hospital for about two weeks and spent about a week in the locked ward. And then they assessed me and, and realized that I needed to have electric convulsive therapy. It scared the bejesus out of me because the only experience I'd had of that prior was watching one floor over the cuckoo's nest. Had about five sessions of that. After the voices, with Barry, I was, I was given my first formal diagnosis of being schizophrenic and was placed on antipsychotic medication. I, I, really, I really seized up my joints and, and it made me feel almost like, like, like lost and confused and I just didn't feel like I was myself. I, I remember saying to mum and dad, can you please help me make my bed? And then not only that, they would have to walk me to the cafe that was... I don't know, it must have been two blocks away and I had to stop and sit on every second fence because I was just so tired all the time. I, I went to see another psychiatrist and he was asking me all these questions and, you know, he said, tell me a few things about yourself. And so I did. In my past, I'd been promiscuous. I had drunk heavily. I'd done a whole lot of things. He said, you haven't got schizophrenia. You've got bipolar. It's really hard to explain. Um, we can't think rationally. For me, I would be walking around the house in circles just trying to take my mind off it. Um, and then if I did feel the panic attack coming on, then I would hop in the bath um, because ever since I was little, I found that a comfort. But there were some days where I would be having a bath every hour just waiting for it to go away. Um, I don't know, it's like the light switch just goes on and then it goes off again. It's just sudden. 
I was a bit of a zombie when I got home, you know, on medication and, and I had weekly sessions with my psychiatrist that I still see today, you know, as an outpatient every three months or so just to check in nowadays. You know, the medical system has been good to me. You know, I've learnt a lot about myself through this process. I realised that, you know, when I got home that I was never going back to that job again. You know, I worked out that A, I wasn't and B, I, I didn't want to. There was one time when I did want to kill myself um, because I thought that it was never going to end and uh, I was envious of all those other people that just felt well. Actually, I don't even know why it started at that time in my life because there were plenty of other times when there were situations way worse than that and I never even developed the anxiety like what I have now. Now I, I, just, I think I just protect myself and I protect my emotional health and I think I've learned the tools and strategies to do that and how to not let things get overboard with my anxiety. And then if I do, do sense the anxiety coming on, I just tell it to rack off because I see it as this thing. And so sometimes, you know, I even just tell it to fuck off. I was at the Royal Children's um, only for two weeks because, um, yeah, it could have been longer, but when I got in there, I decided I didn't want to be like that anymore. Um, I got my mum to bring my guitar in and that's when I started writing my first song. I had lost all motivation around singing and everything. And yeah, it was in that moment that I was like, I don't want to be sick anymore. I don't want to hate myself. I don't want to be sad anymore. Do you have a favourite song or one that has special meaning for you? A song I love is Warrior by Demi Lovato. Um, she had an eating disorder as well, so I really relate to her. And it's about everything she's been through and how she's stronger now, like the warrior. some of your insights I wish that I had dropped the mask and when I dropped the mask I wish that people had seen what was really going on and didn't make assumptions I'm not bitter about that because I think the people I was close to at the time didn't really have an understanding of mental illness I still have bad days um, it's usually, usually just if I need a good night's sleep. Um, tiredness is a biggie because when I get tired, that's when I get sick and sad. Um, I haven't really gotten to see any of the counsellors or anything because most of them are so expensive. The psychiatrist said to me, you'd be amazed how many men like you have this problem. I said, I didn't think men like me have this problem. He said, successful middle-aged men happens to more than you think. Probably the biggest thing is the, the change in thinking was the one that I had to be the one that solved everybody else's problem and, and had to be the rock. You know, I, I can be a bit more vulnerable now and, and I can need help. I did learn that I thought the most important people in my life were my family. You know, now I don't anymore. It's me. I am the most important person in my life because if I'm unwell, I can't help anybody else. You know, I can't be the rock if I'm brittle. That was probably my biggest aha moment. I meditate. 
I find that useful. Uh, yeah, I find a, a calm, abiding omniscience. Omniscience. <laughs> I've been doing it for about um, eight years now, and I tell you what, if I miss a day or two, I feel really ready or rattled. My psychiatrist said to me, he said, you may think that your initial episode had a trigger, but don't. You know, he said, a chemical imbalance in the brain can just happen. And just like you catch a cold, you can get a chemical imbalance in the brain. I said, do I have to go back to hospital and have ECT again? He said, don't be stupid. You know, you're so far off where you were last time. You know, we'll just we'll get you back on medication. It'll take probably two to three weeks and you'll start feeling fine again. So fortunately I got well. Um, Barry and I, we moved in together and we got married. I linked in with a mood support group. I got myself a new psychiatrist and ever since then I, I've been on the right medication. So I, I haven't really got sick. So I gather you've, you've tried medication. Oh, I'm still on meds. I can't do without my medicine. I get unwell without my medicine. Just recently, there's been a stelazine drought and I've been put on another kind of medication and I'm just now starting to, you know, cope with that, but I'm not at a place that's ideal. You know, um, last night I only got about five minutes sleep and sleep is very important. I'm on medication to make the panic and anxiety not as bad, um, but with all my singing and stuff, it's weird because sometimes I'll be super confident and yeah, I can do this. And then at other times I'll just have a full on panic attack and I'll be crying and hyperventilating and I don't know why. I mean, nerves are good, but not to the point they make you shaking the whole way through the performance. Um, I'm on fluoxetine and it's helped because I had some really bad panic attacks when I tried to go off it. I've tried everything. I've tried hypnotherapy, I've tried Psychology, I've seen a psychiatrist. I spent two and a half thousand dollars. Two and a half thousand dollars on a CPAP machine because I was diagnosed with sleep apnea. <laughs> and I was told that it might be a trigger for my anxiety. I mean, you name it, I've, I've tried it, you know. I've, but nothing, none of it has worked for me, none of it at all. I've tried mindfulness. <laughs> but I, I don't really understand it. Um, you know, we could be out walking along the waterfront or along the river and I could be thinking, you know, okay, why am I feeling like this? Is it gone yet? Or no, it's, just, it's just constantly there. Nearly every day is a challenge. Um, just getting out of a day, you know seeing people who are acceptable and uh, who accept me and then meeting and mingling with more people. It's sort of like um, you know, safety in numbers, I suppose. Um, but you have to be acceptable. Could you imagine like um, birds? all the time, or, or a woman screaming through your body all the time. That's what it's like on a bad day. You might ask yourself, well, why don't I just end it? Well, that, that, that was a long time ago. Think things are better now. I go for walks because that helps me a lot. Um, and I like to sing or soft hum. But um, one counsellor did say to me that when you start to feel anxious, you should put your hands under the running water and you should focus on the sensations that you're feeling. So I guess it's like turning off from the anxiety and really focusing on your emotions and um, what you're actually feeling. So um, I guess that's what walking does for me. Is there a song that has special meaning for you or inspires you in any way? 
a song that I really relate to is I Can See Clearly Now The Rain Is Gone by Jimmy Cliff. I think it's the lyrics, the rain is my anxiety. So it just, <laughs> it made me feel better just walking along and singing to it with my headphones on. I think I can make it now, the pain is gone. All of the bad feelings have disappeared. Here is the rainbow I've been praying for. It's gonna be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. It's gonna be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. What do they say? One in three? One in three? One in five people? have mental health issues, but there is still the vast majority of people who just don't get it. No, they just don't get it. Not my stepdad, he's one. He would say, why can't you just go to work and forget about it and get on with your life, you know? And I said, well, okay, well imagine this. Okay, imagine this. You've got a gun to put your head right now, right? Your body is going into, it's going to go into shock, isn't it? If I've got a gun to your head, all right? So imagine I've got a gun to your head, your body goes into shock, yeah? You're gonna start shaking, the room is going to feel like it's spinning and your heart is going to start pounding, okay? Now imagine what's that? Imagine what that's like for us every single day. Hmm? Every single day. Every single fucking day. Well, society doesn't understand mental illness to a great extent. You know, there aren't too many things where your doctor can't say that you're fully recovered or that you won't have a relapse. It's much better than it used to be, but it's still what a way to go. We have to talk to people. We have to connect. That's where education is so important. Every second white female has anxiety these days, and it's nice. It's acceptable. We can deal with it but give them something like bipolar disorder and you can, you can pretty much accept that if you're high, but if you're irritable and it changes, we don't like that. We don't like people with borderline personality disorder that makes everything about them. And, and I'll tell you what, I feel sorry for people with schizophrenia. I feel for them because you're pretty much written off, you're out. You can't have a job, you can't have relationships. They're all the obstacles. All the TV ads in the world about being accepted you won't be accepted. Well, the language that people are using in society, like, get over it, you'll be fine. I don't like that because if it was that easy, then there wouldn't be mental health issues. So I do find that offensive. I think I just really need people to listen and to have empathy. Do your mental health challenges define you? <laughs> <laughs> My mental illness does not define me. I am not post-traumatic stress disorder. I am not anxiety. It's just an illness and it's an illness that I can manage. My personality defines me and my faith, my humour, my artistic creativity, and my ability to draw people together. It makes me, it's, it's part of me, it's who I am, that high, that boisterousness and so on. I wouldn't change it for the world. I wish people could see that it's not me exactly. Um, it's not part of my personality. It's just something that I'm dealing with. It's not the definition of me because I've got so much more than just the struggles that I'm going through. Yeah, I think my experience with anxiety does define me. Uh, because I probably, uh, yeah, I see myself stronger than I was a few years ago. Do you talk to others about your mental health? Um, yeah, I write about my experiences a lot and I sang a song at a mental health conference and a teacher came up to me and she said, I'd love to have you come down to the school and talk to the kids about it. So I went, um, year sevens, eights and nines, and I just spoke about my experiences and 
how I'm still working through them and then I sang a couple of my songs. Some people who try to explain it, I, I really think that they, they scare the general public. Um, sort of as an artistic piece, craziness can be quite interesting, yeah? But in educating the general public, you have to be non-threatening and um, acceptable. I share my experiences uh, as part of teaching mental first aid. It's like you throw these lines out to people and everyone catches them, but some of them pull themselves in towards you. Someone finally said to me, yes, you can talk now. And I do that for other people now. Yeah, I do, I do talk to others about my mental health, you know. I talk about it a lot, especially with people who know what I've been through and my colleagues do. You know, I'm trying, I'm trying so there's no stigma around it, you know? Yeah, I think I'm at a point in my life now where I don't really care what people think. You know, I'm a 36-year-old Indigenous gay man who's grown up with a lot of adversity, a lot of adversity, you know, homophobia, racism. You know, I'm at the point now where I just don't give a shit. I just don't give a damn, Yeah. If you don't like it, you can just fuck off. <laughs> but that's how I feel. You know, I'm not holding back anymore. I'm not holding back anymore. I'm, I've always said if someone has a broken leg, if someone has a broken leg, we wouldn't hide it, would we? Yeah, well, I've had a broken head. The first time I did express my experience of child abuse was, was a really pivotal moment for me. I was working when I was in my 30s and I was studying psychology. And one day the teacher walked in and said, today we're doing child abuse. It was like a fluorescent light went on and went whoosh all through my body. And all I could think of was, my God, get me out of here, get me out of here. And at the end I was packing up my books and my colleague turned to me and she asked, was I okay? And I just looked at her and she could see that I wasn't. She just went. And she said, you don't have to say anything. And then she said, I was abused as a child. She told me her story. And that was the beginning of my recovery because she gave me permission to disclose. What's it been like with your family and your friends? I am, I'm blessed with the most amazing partner. Now he's always, always on my side. He, even when I've been a bit, a little bit irrational, you know, he's always got my back. Even when I'm thinking the worst is going to happen, he's always there by my side. You know, he's the one that's saying, you're allowed to feel this way. You know, he always says that. You know, don't beat yourself up. And, you know, I, um, I honestly don't know where I'd be without him by my side. I really don't. I, I love him dearly. You know, I think it's difficult for my partner at the moment, especially with fine finances, because I haven't been working for about six weeks now. So he's the sole provider for us both. And I know it's hard. You know, things... Things are tight. I know my anxiety is preventing me from getting a job and going out there searching for a job. I know I need to get back though. I know I need to get back, not only for the finances side of things, but for my, up here, my mental state, my mental health. 
well, nobody tiptoes around me. You know, my wife, if she sees that I'm clamping up, she'll make me talk. You know, she'll ask me how I am. And if I say I'm okay, I'm not to say that. You know, I've got to tell her how I actually feel, you know, like good, sad, happy. You know, my wife's help has been critical. She's been amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Too many people are too quick to solve your problems. They absolutely feel a responsibility to us. The good friends I have now, we don't try and fix it. We just listen to each other and say, it's okay, tomorrow is another day because I don't have an answer. My girls are amazing. Um, they were really understanding and really comforting. Um, but I, I was just honest and I just, spoke to them um but I had some friends and they were like my life support um you know but I think it's it's really important just having someone to talk to because then it helps you realize that you're not going nuts because that is what it feels like 20 years ago when I phew, absolute end of my tether you know, there was just one person there for me it wasn't my father it wasn't my mother it was my brother. It was this woman who I'd done wrong to 35 years ago. She was there for me. I, I don't ask, you know, too much of her these days, but we still keep in touch. My husband, uh, he's a bit of a macho male, so even though he says he understands anxiety, he thinks it's funny. So um, if, I have, if I have shared my experiences with him in the past, he uh, tends to make jokes out of it. So I don't really like to share stuff with him about that anymore. But I guess um, I just wish he would listen. What does recovery mean to you? Most of us, it's a, it's a lifelong thing, recovery. Staying connected to family, staying connected to good friends. It means the exercise. It means taking responsibility, not putting that on to anybody else. Education. It's about me being an advocate and it's also about me sharing my journey being happy getting rid of all the negative stuff you've been through but not forgetting about it just like growing and becoming stronger because of it peace but fundamentally that's what recovery is all about if your peace is shattered, it's okay. There's another day. There'll be other seconds, other moments. Tell me what you're good at. What are some of your pleasures? Mm, I do like shopping. <laughs> Wish I had lots and lots of money so I could do lots and lots of shopping. <laughs> I've just seen these, uh, this, this pair of music speakers and uh, $4,000. Not so big, they're not as, uh, not as loud as a bulldozer, but uh, they're sweet. I listen to a lot of music these days. Let me ask you, is there a song that has special meaning for you or that inspires you in some way? Mm, yeah, a uh, song by George Clinton and Bootsy Collins. One nation under a groove. <laughs> yeah, now it's, uh, it's uh, George's song. Uh, he wrote it for um, Black Folk, but uh, look, it's, it's just as uh, appropriate. I think it applies to uh, psychiatric survivors just as well. Because, um, look, <laughs> oh, you know, <laughs> it'd really be fantastic if all of us nutters and crazies got out on the streets and gave it a whirl, you know. Can you imagine it? I mean, <laughs> all us nutters out there. Deal. Deal. Singing. <laughs> Take it to the streets. Sing it. <laughs> One nation under a
I'm good at having relationships with people. I'm good at being a friend. I'm good at being a mother. I'm mediocre at a lot of things, but I enjoy that too. Mediocrity is celebrated. There's too much procrastination in life. People worrying about I'm not good at this or I'm not good at that so that I don't bother. I reckon just give it a go. I remember Dave used to come home from work and I'd already be in my pyjamas and, and I'd scream out, get out the bass. <laughs> he would get out the bass and start playing the bass guitar. We'd both be in our pyjamas and we'd be listening to Diamonds on the Soles of His Shoes. People say she's crazy. She's got diamonds on the soles of her shoes. Well, I guess that's one way to lose these walking blues. Diamonds on the soles of her shoes. She was physically forgotten Till I slipped her into my pocket With my car keys She said you're taking me for granted Because I please you Wearing these diamonds Tell me some of the things you're good at And what gives you pleasure I'm a good listener <laughs> I'm a very good listener I'm, I'm a good friend. I'm a good loyal friend. I'm a good family man. I love my family. I'm a good supporter. I'm not meaning financially at the moment, um, but you know I will be there by your side if you are my family or you are a friend, a close friend. I'm, I'm pretty loyal like that. What about music? Is there a, a song that has a special meaning for you or that inspires you in any way? So, um, you know, I lost all passion for pretty much everything um, because of I'm so consumed about thinking about this, this anxiety, this fuzziness in my head. Um, but there is a song that has special meaning um, to me, uh, Constant Craving by KD Lang. Mm. Now, there's something about that song that every LGBT person can relate to in that song. It's basically craving, craving about y yourself, hmm? to be happy, to be loved. They can all relate to it. Every human being can relate to that song. Every human being. I love it. And um, you know, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautiful song. He You know, I've been through so much, <laughs> so much in my life already. Um, and I've always managed to rise above it and keep pushing through. So I know that you know, five, ten, oh, ten years from now, as hopeless as I feel right now, I do think things will get better eventually. But I've just got to figure out. I've just got to figure out how. Hmm. The future for psychiatric uh, survivors um, has got incrementally better, but um, I'm not really very positive about my own future. Yesterday.
Yeah, you know, I think I blew a relationship yesterday. She's younger than me. She has ambition. She can do better than me. Hopeful about the future. Yeah. Yeah, I am. You know, the kids are happy. My wife's happy. You know, life's not a battle. You know, I'm spending more time with my family and friends and, and, and you know, I spend all January at the beach now. I never used to do that. You're hopeful about my future? Yeah, of course. I've been stable for many years and now I know if I'm ill, I just need to rest. I don't think I do look forward, actually. I basically now just live in the moment. For me, that's enough. The medical system has been really good for me, absolutely. You know, there I was, a public patient thrown in there with a lot of people that I might have judged. You know, they've got problems and so have you. You're no different to them. There's some big questions to be answered. And sometimes the answers are to be found outside the norm. As an adult, the influence of my mental health on my life has been humongous. I had to have the tough times to find the strong me. Hope means that I have a purpose in life and hope to me is about forgiveness. And that doesn't mean forgiving everybody else. It also means forgiving myself. I trip up, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with being mentally vulnerable. I go back every 12 months or so, you know, not for an appointment, but just as a visit with a card and a box of chocolates as a thank you. I also think it's, as a reminder to myself, so I don't forget. It makes me kind of happy that I use what I've been through to help other people because, you know, it makes it feel like it was worthwhile. I would like to learn how to ride the waves. I have hope. I get by with a little help from my friends is a, is a super special song, you know. <laughs> the person singing is obviously flawed and aware of his foibles and limitations, you know. He, he knows he needs his friends to help him out, you know, to stand by him and, and put up with him, you know. It doesn't matter who the person is, you know, it can be anyone, just someone who cares. That guttural scream in the song, you know, it's, it's a massive cry for help. With me, I, I, I never had any depression or, or problems growing up. You know, I, I wasn't a drug addict or I had any issues. It just happened. It, it just happened. What would you do if I sang out a tune? Would you stand up and walk out on me? Lend me your ears and I'll sing you a song and I'll try.